We can look at this in another way. So far we've been talking about persistence of the tubercle bacillus at the level of an infected patient, but this persistence within individuals translates into persistence within human populations. And this is nicely illustrated using the so-called SEIR model of epidemic dynamics in which susceptible human populations are broken down into four compartments, if you like. A compartment of susceptibles, that is individuals who have not yet been infected but who could be infected. A population of exposed individuals, these are individuals who have acquired the infection but are not yet transmitting it. An infectious compartment, describing those individuals who both have the pathogen and are actively transmitting it. And a recovered population, indicating individuals who have gotten over the illness and are no longer infection. Now if we look at a typical acute and transient infection like the measles virus, which has been very well studied epidemiologically, what we can see is that the transit through these four compartments is very rapid and unidirectional. So an individual who is susceptible and becomes exposed to measles will incubate the infection for a period of about two weeks before he or she becomes infectious to others around them. That period of infectiousness lasts for only about a week or two before the individual either dies of the infection or hopefully recovers from infection. Transit through these compartments is unidirectional because the acquired immunity that develops during infection is solidly protective against reinfection. So if you've had measles once, you're not going to get measles again. In contrast, a persistent chronic infection like TB shows very different dynamics. First of all, when a susceptible individual becomes exposed to TB, the period of time that elapses between exposure and the development of infectiousness can last anything from months to, as I've said already, decades. In other words, a latently infected individual can continue to harbor the pathogen for a lifetime. Furthermore, once an individual becomes infectious to others, that period can last again for a period anything from months to decades before either death or recovery occurs. In the pre-chemotherapeutic era, it was very common for individuals who had to have relapsing bouts of tuberculosis over periods of many years or even decades. This obviously maximizes opportunities for transmission in the community. Furthermore, an individual who has recovered from tuberculosis is not protected against reinfection. So an individual, unlike in the case of measles, where an individual who's had measles is not going to get measles again, an individual who has had TB can be reinfected again one or many times. So the acquired immunity that develops in the course of infection not only does not necessarily clear the pathogen, it does not prevent reinfection either. This causes the epidemic dynamics of TB to be radically different from those of sort of garden variety, uh, acute infections like measles. And this translates into an epidemiological parameter that is starting, startlingly different between these two categories of diseases. This is called the critical community size. This is simply a measure of how large a population of contiguous interacting individuals is required to maintain a pathogen permanently without burnout or reintroduction from another source. In the case of measles, this number is about 300,000. In other words, a minimum population of 300,000 is required to sustain measles indefinitely without burnout or reintroduction. In the case of TB, this number is on the order of one or 200, very small. And this explains, I think, why tuberculosis is such an ancient pathogen. It's well adapted to surviving in small, scattered populations of its host, in this case, human beings, which of course describes the state of humanity until the very recent history, as I described earlier.